My name is Fiona Byrne. It's the 4th of December 2023. I'm conducting an interview with Ilana Ya'ari. We are in New York, New York, and the interview is in English. Hi, Ilana. Hi. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Ilana Ya'ari. Uh, what do I what do you want to say? <laughs> Can you spell your name, please? I-L-A-N-A Y-A-A-R-I And what was your name at birth? Halina H-A-L-I-N-A Did you have any other names? Once I had during the Holocaust, but it wasn't really official, but there was another name. Yadviga Can you spell it? J-A-D-W-I G A. And when were you born? 1935. 10-10-1935. How old are you today? Today I'm 88. Where were you born? In Warsaw, Poland. And do you know your maternal grandparents' names? Maternal grandparents. Uh, family name? Uh, first and last. Um, okay, um, on my mother's side, the name was Zimler. I have no idea what was her first name. On my father's, but they had three, she had three wives. I don't know in which wife. Um, on my father's name is Buchwald, and the name was Zipora. What was your mother's name? Miriam. And where was she born? She, her name was Miriam, the Jewish name, but they act, I mean, we call, they call her Marilla, Marilka. And her last name? My mother's uh, maiden name, Zimler. Z-Y-M-L-E-R. What's your strongest memory of your mother? Um, she, I kind of look like her, a lot. She was a very... <laughs> serious intellectual, and she was an artist, she was a painter. What were your paternal grandparents' names? Paternal grandparents? Uh, I don't remember. I mean, my father's parents? Yes. No clue. Um, what was your father's name? Eliyahu. E-L-I-A-H-U. Last name? Buchwald. Where was he born? He born in on the in a place named Stashuf, I believe. I'm not sure. S T A C no S T A S Z U W maybe or maybe O I'm not sure. And where is that? I'm sorry? Where? It's on the Russian border between Poland and Russia, someplace. It's not Ukraine. I don't know exactly where this place exists. And what was your father's occupation? He was an artist. He was um, pro producing, which I have some art of his here, uh, art crafts, it's mostly religious art crafts and also jewelry. What's your strongest memory of your father? Mm. The best man in the world. <laughs> it's incredible. He saved my life. He was he was pretty incredible human being. Did you have any siblings? No. What language did you speak at home? Polish. And outside the home? Polish. Can you describe your home in detail? Well, it was a very nice apartment in Warsaw. In, the address is Twarda, T-W-A-R-D-A. -A. Um, and we had a beautiful apartment with three, three rooms. At that time, it was considered very big. And very large kitchen, and it was just luxury apartment. Did anyone else live in the home? My parents, and myself, and my nanny. And what was your nanny's name? Marisha. Well, if the name on the, on the birth certificate, it's probably Mariana. It's M-A-R-I-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. 
and you called her Marisha. Marisha. Can you spell that? Yes, M A R Y S A S I A. What part of town did you live in? In Warsaw. Close to the Jewish quarters, was, uh, I can t give you the address. Farda 7, it was across the street from the biggest um, temple, Nozik Synagogue. And what kind of neighborhood was it? It wasn't predominantly Jewish neighborhood, I think it was mixed. Did your family belong to any religious groups? Now that I know. My, my mother for sure not. And what Jewish rituals did you observe in the home? I'm sorry, what? Should we wait for the... Let's take a pause. Yeah, just for the sound outside. Yeah. What Jewish rituals did you observe in the home? We didn't have Shabbat. We did, my mother didn't light candles. But we, do, we did have holidays, specifically Passover, so I remember that. My father was more traditional, so he, she did it for him. But we really, it was not a religious family. Where, did, where were you when you heard the war had started? Did they heard the word what? Had started. Where were you when the war started? Oh, when the war started. When the war started, I was actually in the countryside. My, my grandfather had a villa in a place named Otvotsk, O-T, W O K C K. I'm not sure. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, it's a beautiful place. It's a resort place, and my father, my grandfather, was very wealthy, and he had a beautiful villa. And we were spending the summer there or every summer. What was your grandfather's occupation? He was actually a businessman, a uh, real estate tycoon, and he also had bakery as side business. He wasn't making, but he had, yeah, he was a businessman. Okay. He also was an artist, by the way. What kind of art? Same thing as my mom. It was, it was painting. And uh, what were the paintings of? What they... What did they paint? Mostly, my mom painted all sorts of stuff, but he did mostly nature stuff. Do you have any of their paintings? Not of his, not my mom. But I do have somebody else paid, which I couldn't find it. I have it someplace. Um, this whole family was a, a bunch of artists, so everybody was, yeah. Okay. Um, so what happened when you heard the war had started? I was small. I was three years old. Well, we were, we were in the countryside, and my father was in Warsaw. Okay. It was with my mom and my nanny there and my grandfather. Uh, obviously, the war started and he got really panicky, so he took the train and came to see us. You have to understand that the war in 39 started very quickly. People weren't really prepared for that. It was kind of um, closing their eyes on what's going on around, but it came very quickly. Nobody was anticipating that they're going to bombard Warsaw in, in that short period of time. So anyway, he must have heard that going, something was going on and he decided to bring his family back home. So he took a train, which was one of the last trains. It was an electronic train, electric train from Warsaw to Otvotsk. Uh, and he said, we have to go rush back home. And that's what we did. And what happened when you got back to your apartment? <laughs> When we got to our apartment, we, heard, we were bombarding Warsaw left and right, and there was fire all over the place. Um, my mother, the artist, she took a black... People say that you, have to, that you have to put black paper on the windows so, so they, they won't see you when they don't bomb. I was just stupid, but anyway. But she took this black paper and she made strips of black paper and she put it like a net on the window, and I started screaming because I got scared of it. But they, today I understand that she understood, she was a very smart woman, very intelligent, and an artist, so she understood 
that we're going to be in prison for the rest of our lives. It's just, basically, that's what she expressed on these windows. Which at that point I was scared from all this painting. She usually painted flowers. But this time she didn't paint flowers. And that was true because she kind of, since that moment, it wasn't the same woman. She closed herself up behind that, those black papers. I remember it as a small little girl. How did she change after that? She didn't change. She, she was depressed. She was not herself ever again. She was extremely smart and very artistic and very intelligent. She knew what's going on. People, you know, people kind of believe this. People don't want to accept reality, but she did. And your father, how did he respond to Well, he was always a very cheerful man, very optimistic. He always saw the, the how do you say it? <laughs> the other side have full, the other glass have full. Um, so he said, no, 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 everything's be okay, you know, da, da. He, knew his, he knew his wife, she was hysterical. But uh, he, he said, we're gonna, we're always looking for a way out of any situation, which is really important. It's probably most important. So he will take care of that, everything will be fine, you know. That's what he did. So we started adjusting to the new reality. And how long did you stay in your apartment? At that night, for all, in uh, general, what is the question? Yeah, how long were you in the apartment until you before you had to leave? Oh, to live in that apartment? Yeah. I'd say it's at the end of forty one. And did you have to move to the ghetto? We were in where we lived. They considered that a ghetto it was part of the the large ghetto. They had two ghettos in in Warsaw. It was a large ghetto and a small ghetto. The large ghetto was supposedly better than the small ghetto. So he we were a part of the large ghetto. That means when they starting enclosing the territory, we belong to one of those territories. So we didn't have to move for some time. And your belongings, were you able to keep all of your belongings? No, because every day, I mean, when the war, <coughs> when the bombarding ended, it was a little bit quiet until German, you know, figured out how this all gonna work. I'm, I suppose they knew that from before because they made a very accurate plan how, what they're gonna do with the Jews. So they did it systematically. Obviously, you cannot just do it they, if they wanted, they had two goals. Germany had two goals. One goal, the most important one for them, was get rid of the Jews. The other goal was take anything that you can from the Jews instead of their teeth and hair and all the possessions. And whatever you can convert into some materialistic possession for Germany, they wanted to take from the Jews. So they started little by little uh, put announcements on the streets and whatever because we're not supposed to listen to any radio that was immediately disconnected any type of connection to the outside world was totally discounted so the way they communicated it they communicated in two ways one was all these announcements on the streets that you could see all sorts of big announcements, and the other was the Jewish police. Uh, but the way they did it, they were actually pretty clever. They weren't clever. They, this plan was already drafted years before they started doing that. Uh, they created um, the municipality, a Jewish municipality, because they did not want directly to deal with the Jews, they wanted Jews to deal with the Jews. And that was brilliant from their point of view. So basically the idea was, if you're looking in the big picture, that the Jews are going to kill the Jews. And that's basically what they did. I mean, the, the municipality they created that had orders from the Jewish police to, let's say, to deliver that many people to Treblinka. 
Oh, they do this and that, and you have to bring all your possession, you have to bring your fare, you have to bring your jewelry. You have everything. everything was done through this Jewish municipality with the help of the Jewish police. So the Germans supposedly did not interact directly with the Jewish population. So did you have to turn your belongings over? Oh sure, every day was another announcement. Today is the jewelry, tomorrow is the silver, tomorrow is the fair, tomorrow is this, tomorrow is that. Obviously I was a small little girl, I was four years old, so I, I did not know what's going on, but I did know what's going on. I said, why are you taking my mother's fair? Why are you giving it away? Why are you giving this away? I must say, they, they, from their point of view, that was brilliant what they did. They decided that we're not going to kill the Jews. The Jews are going to kill the Jews. So how long uh, were you... When did you have to leave your apartment? Um, 1943. I said the end of 1942. And was your nanny with you the whole time? No. At one point they said that all the Gentiles, she was a Gentile, had to leave the ghetto. They had to go to the Polish side, to the, yeah. So she left, like I would say, six or seven, I can't be exact, but I think she about seven or eight months. And where did you go when you left your apartment? We had to leave that place because we, they were, they were trying to condense more of the population, so it's obviously easier to rule and easier to kill. So they created what they, they moved from the large ghetto to the small ghetto. They say all the Jews have to go. So we left, we left and that we're talking beginning of 1943. And what, where did you go in the small ghetto? Okay, that was a problem, but my father was a very, you know, handsome kind of person. And we found a small little apartment. We, we have to understand that my apartment, the first one, we had three rooms, beautiful kitchen, beautiful bedroom. He, he brought us to a small, tiny little nothing. I don't even remember it was a bedroom there. Yeah, it was. It was a small, tiny kitchen. So he found some place. I have no idea. Only he could do it. But he did find something on one of the floors and moved there. And he moved us by himself. We had a I want to call it uh, hands uh, wheeler, and uh, he, he loaded some of the belongings. We did not have many because most of those were already given to the German. So just for the siren. I mean, if we pause, do we, should we pause every time or just keep going? We should just keep going. Okay. Um, do you recall what the new apartment looked like? Small little room, it was a closet, and it was a kitchen. Was there any furniture? It was a small table, small table and chair, and it was a bed. Where did you sleep? I slept with my parents. Do you remember your day-to-day -day life? At that time in the ghetto, what was your daily life like? Hiding. Because there was already very well understood that they want to liquidate. I'm really going very fast. It wasn't that fast. But anyway, little by little there was announcements done to the Jewish municipality, which they say the Jewish community how many Jews have to be delivered to Umschlagplatz. Umschlag, you know what Umschlagplatz is? Okay. Uh, so, why did I tell you that? Hiding. For a reason. You were hiding. Yeah, that was very clear that uh, the, the Jewish police had an order. Every Jewish policeman had an order to bring five people every day to Umschlagplatz. Actually, do you know about the conference? Let's, let's back up a little bit, some history. Do you know there was a big conference in 1943 between Eichmann, Himmler, and one more of them, I don't remember his name, but um, this conference, they decided what's going to happen with the Jewish question over a drink. 
you can see a very big painting in the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which I am a speaker of. So that's when they decided this was going to be the end of it. We're really going very fast, but at that point, they wanted all the Jews go to Treblinka and finish the story. Number one, the war wasn't looking very good to the German. Uh, they started losing. They like, were getting close to Rashnab, and so they kind of knew that this. And the second, they wanted to kill all the evidence. So they wanted to make sure that all the Jews are being finished because they were witnesses of the most horrible thing that happened in history. So they wanted to make sure that everybody goes to Treblinka, everybody get killed, and they will be clean. Well, um, and that wasn't that simple, obviously, because people were hiding and, you know, trying to run away and all of that. But um, he went for, I don't know if you know the name Chernyakov. You should name if you're doing these interviews. That he committed suicide. You know that or you don't know that. Chernyakov was the head of the Jewish, Jewish, how would they call it, I mean, this agency, right, that the German created, that was going to be dealing with Jews directly. Rather, that, The whole thing that they actually constructed is the way that the Jews will be killed by Jews. It's an unbelievable concept. So they created that special place, called Gmina, with Chernyakov, you must have heard that name, he committed suicide. Um, he was the head of this Jewish facility and they told him to bring 900 people to deliver to Umschlag plants. At that point he committed suicide because he knew that they never going to come back. And so again, Jews killing Jews, that means he had to make sure that he delivered a certain amount of Jews. This is probably the most important thing in the interview that I'm telling you. He, the German, that was the concept. The Jews are going to kill Jews. And that's how he was, they were trying to expedite it, through the Jewish policemen, through the Jewish facilities, by lying to them and offering them life instead of death if they're going to kill other people. This is just unbelievable. I'm starting to get excited when I talk about it. Um, so, Charnikov committed suicide. He was supposed to deliver 900 people to Umschlagplatz. And that was really the beginning of the end. They went all the way. They told every Jewish policeman he has to deliver five Jews every single day. They had the time limit that they wanted to finish with the ghetto. So going back to the, your daily life in the ghetto. There was no daily life. That was hiding. What did your parents do? Well, <laughs> my mother, you know, people lived in this ghetto in just by figuring out what's the best that they can do, living with some hope. My mom, which was depressed to the bone after she put the black straps on the window, decided that they, she heard, I don't know, it's hard for me to tell you, that if you work for the German, then you will stay alive, which was kind of true. So she volunteered work for one of the factories to sew some, you know, clothes. She had no idea how to do it. She was an artist. But but she said that better that my father stays home, and she goes. And so she went, and she had a sister. Her sister was gorgeous. She was a beautiful woman. Um, my mom was beautiful, but not like her. She was more beautiful. What was her name? Dora. Dora. And so they both went to this factory, right? My mom had no idea how to sew munders, German munders. The other one could because she had actually hands on it. So when they coming back home, my mom didn't come back. They did the selection over there and they get rid of people that they are not useful for them. My mom didn't work, she was not one of those. And well, her sister survived, so she came back home and told us what the story was. Do you know what month that was? What yeah, month? it was Rosh Hashanah, it was September. What year? 
Pardon? What year? 43. That was the year, that was the year that everything happened in 43. And what did Dora say when she got home? They didn't have to say. When somebody didn't get home, we knew what happened. So I didn't, uh, literally I did not understand or didn't want to understand, but I did understand that I'm lo losing my mother. My father, as optimistic that he was, and smart that he was, he lost his school. He really took it very hard, okay? Um, he kept me at night, all night crying. And then by the end of it, he said, listen, we have to run away from this place. Or we're gonna get killed. And, uh, you know, I was five years old, when was three, four, three, three, almost six. Um, and he said, listen, that's what we're gonna do. Because they, the German were actually scouting every single apartment, not necessarily German, it's the G Jewish police, scouting every apartment and they digging out any Jew that they could find and bring him to Umschlagplatz, Umschlagplatz to Treblinka. So my father, my nanny was not there anymore because they told the, the gentiles to leave the ghetto. So my father told me this, as optimistic as he always was, he says, the only chance that we have is I have to get a connection outside of the ghetto and maybe we can figure out something to get out because he, he said, you see what happened, they took mommy there. He didn't tell me she's gonna get killed, but he, he didn't have to tell me that. So he said, but you will have to stay home. I would, I wanna go, I'm gonna volunteer to work for the German. What is this work? Is cleaning up the evidence, all the dead people outside of the ghetto to make sure that they're not there which is horrible. Um, he said, I will go out because I, we have a lot of Polish people that we knew. Maybe, maybe some chance that we can find somebody is the only way we can survive. And he was very, very clear about that. As usual, it was such a loving, beautiful person. So he said, so where am I gonna go? He said, you're gonna stay in this apartment. At that point, the German were cleaning, Klomar, the German, with the Jewish police were cleaning every single apartment in the Warsaw Ghetto, cleaning, literally going from place to place, from apartment to apartment, digging out the Jews. So he said, and he had to leave me there instead of go. When, if you have to go to work for them, what do you think work was there? to cleaning up dead people, cleaning up the evidence, so they wanted to. So we had like, um, Polish is pretty cold in the winter, so we had a box with coal, you know. He empty up that box and he said, I'm gonna put you in the coal box. You're gonna stay there until I come back. The coal box was the size of a quarter of that side table. I was very tiny, I'm tiny now, but it was tiny. Um, and you're not going to move, and I'll give you a little air to breathe, you have something to eat. Um, and when somebody comes to this apartment, you just freeze. You know, not going to do anything. And that was exactly happened, and he left in the morning, had to leave early. He volunteered to collect the, the dead people, he put me in that call box. I had a doll, she let me have it there and he opened just a little bit, and he put dirty dishes on the box, that dripping, you know, it looks like this place is empty and vacant. We took pillows and threw the feather all over, made a mess out of that place. And they came, the gendarmes and the policemen. They were walking and he, oh, he left the windows open and it was like pretty cold, it was like October, I think. So I froze. They walk, I walk, I walk, I walk out. They didn't find me. Um, I totally froze. When my, my father came back at night, I'm sure he was afraid to open the box. Right, I, 
in the box you live like, I don't know if you know this expression, you know what superposition is? Superposition is that you are in two, few positions at the same time, so I felt that I'm alive and dead at the same time. How? We're talking about nine, ten hours in the box, in the front. He opened the box and I was frozen and he pulled me out of there but I, I survived and I told him and I was six years old at that time I think, yeah. And I told him, no way I'm going to do it again. You can do whatever you want. They can kill me, they can take me whatever. No more bucks. So he said, well, the Jews, and he was also very optimistic, it was the opposite of my mother. <coughs> so he said, we have always, there's always another option. That's how we lived by, which is kind of nice. I'm trying to do that to this day, but it doesn't work. Um, so he said, I'm going to take you to some friends in the morning. they hiding under the floor. Um, you're not going to be alone, you're not going to be in a box, I bring you there, and yeah. I said, fine, because this box is not happening. So the next morning, he would come very early, it was really even dark, I think, when we went to this place that he had some, he knew a lot of people in Warsaw because of the stuff that he was doing. Uh, he took me to a place that was, the people were hiding under the floor and on top of it they put a bed up to camouflage that entrance to this place. And there was 52 people there, 53 or 52, I'm not sure. There were some people with babies, you name it. Okay, so at least I had company. So I wasn't alone and I was not in a box, so it was good, it was improvement. Upgrade. Um, in the meantime, people were, the streets were empty. People weren't just cruising the streets because everybody was hiding it. They knew the minute they're being caught, they're going to be dead. But there was some drunk Jew that was walking on the street. And the Jewish policeman came across to him and uh, they wanted to kill him. And he said, no, 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 don't kill me. I'll show you when another 53 people are. <laughs> he brought them right there where we were there. So, uh, so the, the German came in. I mean, there was German and Jewish police together. And they moved the bed up and they opened the hall. And I'll never forget the face. It was very, they were drunk. This German was like red, was disgusting. And, his face just showed in the in that hall. That, that that will probably be a nightmare for me for the rest of my life. And they dig us out from this hall, and they counting us because they had to send a report to Eichmann because he had to make room in the trains. Everything has to be well done. The German talking to you. I was number five. They were, they were counting. I remember. I knew how to count. So it was I try drive here from Nef. I was number five, and we were fifty-three people. They marched us straight to Umschlagplatz. You know what Umschlagplatz is. Okay. I think I was frozen. There was no emotions. I wasn't crying. I think it came to a point that. You know, physics says you are in superposition. You don't know if you are dead or alive. No, I don't have to tell you what Umschlagplatz is, right? No. You know that? I do. Okay. Now, I'm a little girl with 53 people that I don't know in Umschlagplatz. Was anyone taking care of you? Who cares? What are you talking about? Yeah. Who's taking care of who? People, people who barely want to survive themselves, they don't care. But I, I, you know, I had my brain together, so I found a little... You, you are, as I explained to you, you, you come into a stage that you are frozen. There are no emotions. 
They kill you, all your emotions. You just, you're just a robot. That's what you are. Luckily, my, my father always was telling me stories. I love the fairy tales. It was my favorite thing. I wouldn't go to sleep without a fairy tale. So he was telling me fairy tales, and it's always a good ending with fairy tales, always. And I started fantasizing. It's, I'm in a fairy tale, something's good gonna happen. And I found, so, found the little place under a bench, and I knew that I have to hide, I knew that and mentally. So I went crawl after the desert. Nobody could see me because I was so tiny, small. Uh, to make the long story short, every three days they were shipping people to Treblinka. But what happened, you probably know the history of uh, What happened? Why they didn't kill people? You see if you know what I'm talking about. We probably have to edit this out, but yeah, um, because the um, leadership uh, was accepting too many trains and the bodies were mounting up on the platforms, so they suspended operations while they reorganized the camp and they, they uh, dismissed the commandant and enlisted a new person. So there was another reason. There was a revolt in Treblinka. Uh, yeah, in 43. Right. I'm talking about 42. Yeah, yeah, there was a revolt and the people ran away. There was no people to put people in the ovens. They closed Treblinka. That's how I'm alive. So they kept us there for a month because they, they couldn't, they probably didn't want to, I don't know why they didn't kill all of us there, but they didn't, they, because too much evidence. They, they were afraid. They, these people, it's a crime against humanity. They wanted to cover up all the garbage that they did. And what's your memory of uh, the Umschlagplatz. What my memory? Yeah, what, what should see. But I have a testimony. Yeah. Um, Gray, I I I was a speaker this year in Temple Emmanuel uh, about this whole thing. About it was eighty years of Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Right. And I was a speaker there. So if you read that, it's on the internet. <laughs> um, what they did. Um, what, what do you want to say? Wait a second. What was the question? Um, what's your memory of the Umschlag? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, they everything was gray. When we came there, I mean, the place was just gray. And they were giving food once a day. There was soup made out of potato peels. Just one second. Um, so they're giving that soup once a day and black coffee. That's what I remember. I don't remember any bread or anything like that. And you were there for a month, you said? I was there for a month because they closed Treblinka. Yeah? Did your father know where you were? Of course he knew. Where could he be? He knew that I'm there. And he was working on a way to get me out of there. Right. Which he did, okay? He had a friend, a Jewish policeman. His name is... Shepsel, put it down, this is very important. Shepsel Rotholz. Yeah. You read? You, so then he must, my father had all sorts of crafts and stuff that he did. And he probably sold it. I don't know. He, may, he must have money because he must have paid this man handsomely. Um, and it's interesting that the Germans didn't kill all of us because they, they couldn't do it. There was, there was no one to kill the evidence. Do you know what I mean? Uh, they, they could have shot all of us there, but they didn't. They kept us all there. Um, besides the babies, they took the babies and threw them on the, against the wall and killed them. But did you see that happen? Of course. So, my father got the call of this policeman, Rothholz. He knew him before the war from somewhere. This Rothholz was very famous. He was a famous boxer, and he was, um, was supposed to be in the Olympics in Germany, and he refused. It was before it was in thirty nine or thirty eight. I mean, 
and he refused to fight in Germany, and he became a Jewish policeman, which they were very happy because he was strong, beautiful. It's exactly what they were looking for. My father got a hold of him and must have given him everything we had, all his money. We had money. We had something. I don't know what he had. He said, you get my little girl out of this place. And luckily, the German were accepting briberies, a lot of it. They didn't mind to get money from you. So how he did it, I don't know. But one night he came, he told me, get, get up, and eh, put me under his coat. He was a big man, coat. The German, you know, the long army coat. He, he tucked me under that, put me on the rickshaw, and we went out of Umschlagplatz. And where did he take you? What he said to me? Where did he take you? To my father. And where, where was your father? And my father was with some family in ghetto. And when I came there, I closed my eyes and I refused to open my eyes because I was afraid that if I opened my eyes, this was just a dream and I'm still, still in that box, in the box in Umschlagplatz or whatever. But finally, my father talked to me, talked to me, talked to me, and then I heard another voice. When I opened my eyes, was my nanny there. And how did your nanny come to be there? My, my nanny. <laughs> my nanny was one of the most amazing people I know ever. She took a Jewish the band, and she opened, and she walked with the Jews that were going out to work outside of the ghetto. She put the, you know, that white thing with the Jewish star, and she got in. And you know what her name is? Maria Popinska. And what does it remind you? Mary Poppins. Yeah. And she got me out of there. Um, how did she get you out of there? Well, we got connected back to this policeman, and he must have bribed the German in the gate gave them money, and early, early in the morning, uh, my father brought us there, we got out. Where did she take you? Okay, where did she take me? Um, just a second. How do I get through this thing? I'm gonna pause the camera. Okay. So, your nanny... Then my nanny brought me to this Marta cousin, and that's what I... Stayed with her through all the war, but it's a lot of other things. Um, so, so your nanny took you to her cousin's apartment. Yeah. And how long did you stay there? Well, basically, we were, I were on and off from this place, but uh, the, I finished the war, not there actually, but. Uh, we were on and off. We couldn't stay there for a long time, but my father created a network of underground network people that took care of us here and there and everywhere. There was a, a Jewish organization that was a secret Jewish organization in Warsaw Ghetto, um, and he was connected. I don't know how this man was connected to everybody, but. There was a way to transfer money to people, there was a way to connect to other people on the other side, and this other person on the other side uh, actually saved 100 Jews, this Nanguzhenska um, woman, yeah. And she, she figured out where I should be, and she was kind of monitoring my, my staying on the other side. But there was a lot of other things happened, but... Were you able to move from place to place during the day? When I was in the Polish side, sure. But I, listen, I don't have a Jewish physiognomy. Right now I have gray hair, but I had semi-blonde hair. It looked completely like a Polish little girl. My nanny looked like Jews. Look at the picture. Um, did you get new identity papers? I got a birth certificate, you know, false birth certificate. And did you go to school? What? <laughs> He's talking about. No. I went to school after, after the war. I'm educated, but not during the war. 
And when you were hiding, were you hiding with other Jewish people? Actually, it was one, yes. We were in the countryside that that woman arranged with. She actually saved 100 Jews. It was like a whole network. Uh, there was, a, in the place we were, and that other one, Vishneva Gura, that was a nice little home, nice house. There was a countryside. And there was two rooms. I was my nanny in one room, and the other room was another Jewish woman with the son. And what was your life like during the day when you were in hiding? Over there? Very good to run away. I don't look like a Jew. So I could run around, not, not far away, but I didn't have to hide. I had blue eyes and blonde hair. So I was playing, so I, was, <laughs> I was shooting Germans all day long. <laughs> I, I made myself a bow and arrow. <laughs> shooting Germans. Uh, were you aware of what was going on with your father when you were in hiding? You have to understand. The, the, the children during the Holocaust were grown-ups. They grew up so fast, like not normal. I knew everything. I knew that my father would never come back. Mm. I knew that. Lucky I had an amazing nanny. She, the woman was... I'm just coming back from Poland. I went to Israel on October 7. <laughs> when, did you stay in Warsaw? for the entirety of the war? I'm sorry, what? Were you in Warsaw the, during the whole war? Yeah. Do you remember the ghetto uprising? Actually, I was out of ghetto right before the ghetto uprising started. But I, what I did see from the other side, when, when I lived in Grochow, I see the ghetto burning. They were burning for five days, and you could see the flames. And you knew your father had been in the ghetto. Yeah, but I never believed that he's going to get killed, which he didn't, actually, at that time. They, again, collected some of the Jews that survived, and they engaged them to clean up their evidence, and after they shot them. It was one of them. Okay. Where were you when uh, you heard the war was over? I was with my nanny for a while, not for a long time. What happened for you not to be with her? No, I was, be, I was with her until I left for Israel. Uh, she was working, before she came to work for my, fa for my parents, she worked for my grandfather. So all the siblings knew her, knew who she was. So after the war, my, I had an aunt who went to Russia. She survived. And that, we found each other. So it took us both, because she knew her. She knew her because it was my, my mom's sister. So your aunt came and found you with your nanny? No, actually, she didn't find me. We found her, but it doesn't matter. Oh, I see. It was my, mom, it was my mother's sister. She was married to a guy, and then she had another boy. How long did you stay in Warsaw after the war was over? Until 1950. And what did you do in those Went times? to school. Went to high school. What was it like going to high school, having never been to primary school? It was actually very interesting, because after the war, there were a bunch of Jewish kids that were all sorts of ages, you know, 9, 10, 12, whatever. So the Jewish agency collected all of these poor kids and they created a school, all the ages, together. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and I was there. And I excelled, so I was able to kind of match these other older ones. So I went very fast to high school, younger than I was supposed to. I'll give you, I'll show you a picture of me of high school. I was the youngest one there. I finished high school in Poland. And after high school... You went to Israel. Uh, who did you go to Israel with? My aunt. And how did you get there? By train, by boat. <laughs> Where did you go when you arrived in Israel? We went to a kibbutz. You know what kibbutz is? 
So that's where we went, the, the children after the Holocaust. Um, and then I went to the army. How many people were in the kibbutz? Oh, <laughs> hundreds. Do you know what kibbutz is? Okay. Did you talk about the war? No. You have to understand the children after the Holocaust are the problem. Nobody wants to talk about that stuff anymore. I really didn't want to talk to this until my children even didn't know. Nobody knew. I mean, they knew, but they didn't know the story because I refused to speak about it until I was... One of my birthdays, I was already married with kids and grandchildren. So my, my son, the one Ronin, he started pushing, pushing, pushing. You have to talk, you have to talk. And so this, the whole thing started. But then, then I became a speaker for the Museum of Jewish Heritage here in New York. What year did you join the army in Israel? 52. And how many years were you in the army? Two years, like everybody else. How did you meet your husband? Actually, when I finished the army, my husband was also a Holocaust survivor. And he lived in a place where my aunt was living. I met him there. Where was that? Pardon? Where was that? I finished the army in 1954. 1954. In what country? Israel. Did you and your husband ever talk about the Holocaust? No. No. I put everything in the call box. Until my son, Ronen, he started digging it out. Listen, I became a soldier, a proud young woman, educated, worked for the Israeli Technion. I was nothing to do with what happened in the Holocaust. To this day, I am a working woman. I'm 88 years old. When did you get married? When did I get married? In 1952. And where did you live after getting married? That's not true. What are you talking about? 1952, 1954, I finished the army. 1958, 1957. Yes. And where did you live after you got married? We lived in a beautiful place named Tivon in Israel. And when was your first child born? I'm sorry? When was your first child born? 1958. And what did you call them? Ronin. Did you have more children? Yeah, I have one more, Eyal. He lives right here. And what year was he born? He was five years, 1964. Do you have grandchildren? Oh, yeah. Five of them. What are their names? What are the names? Tal, which means a uh, morning dew, yeah? Lior, which means sunshine, my sunshine, Oren, which is a pine tree, Teva, which means nature, and Tamar, which is a, a date, a free. And are your, the rest of your family involved in any Holocaust groups? No. My, gra my youngest granddaughter, Tamar, is right now in the Israeli army. And she got an award from the President of Israel, Les Yom Atzmaut. When did she get that award? This year. Oh. Let's see. Let me see if I can find her someplace. Oh, yeah, sorry. So where were you on October 7th? I was in Jerusalem. I took these people to Yad Vashem. So they wanted to see the, their names engraved 
and the other was shameful. They got awards, those two women. So the immediate family, they, they already passed away, but the immediate family wanted to see. The, the son of this Marta wanted to see the Yad Vashem. So we went to Israel. So you went with the families of Marta and Mariana to Israel? With the family. With the families, right. Yeah. And on, on, I, I landed in Israel on October 6th and got out from there on October 8th, 10th. What was your first thought on October 7th? I, listen, I lived in Israel, so for me, people, it was like, you know, things like that happen in Israel. It's not nothing new. I was not alarmed with this thing at all. But they were, the Polish people. And they became very serious, and these people left children at home, and the young men uh, said, we have to get out. You should read the story. Ronen wrote this whole story about this, me going out on, on a Polish Air Force plane back to Poland. That's how you left? Yeah. There was no way to leave Israel. There was no, Orpert was full of people. And they were the other men they want to leave. So what are they going to do with me? Even though I have a, two granddaughters in Israel, one of them is in the army, but they took her to the army back. So anyway, uh, she was it's an amazing family. There's no, I don't know anybody in this world that does as good as people. This are amazing. So he arranged, you should read the story that Ronan wrote. You know, definitely have to read that because yeah. I know the whole thing. There's pictures there and everything. And we, you know, they, they went, we went to the Polish embassy, they sent a Polish Air Force plane, and we left to Poland. What do you think about the rise of anti-Semitism Horrible. But it's a very complicated situation. It's more complicated than it looks on the surface of what you see. Okay, that's very much a lot of that is involved in what's happening in Israel right now. Not everybody really understands the Israel point of view. They look at the news. Uh, it's very difficult. It's, uh, I don't even know what's going to be the end results of this whole thing. Do you experience anti-Semitism here in the US? Me personally? No. Personally, I didn't feel any anti-Semitism, but I'll speak about it a lot. I'm a public speaker. Warsaw since the war? Did I have been to work? Have you been to Warsaw since? Oh yeah, uh, I was, this is the, this is the third time I'm in Warsaw after the war. When was the first time you returned? Let me see, 50, 60 something, I don't remember exactly, 68? Then we went again, and on my 80th birthday, we went, the whole family went to Warsaw. And um, why did you go back? With my family? Of oh, oh, first time. The first time? The first time I wanted to see my nanny, the family that saved my life. And did you see her? I ma managed to see her just before she died. What was that like? Well, she had Alzheimer's, but she, she was very sick. When I saw her, she didn't know who I, I think maybe she knew, I don't know. But I see, I managed to see her and the other family, you know, the other woman. Marta? Mm -hmm. Did you see uh, She was okay. You saw Marta? Yeah. Because my, my nanny was at her apartment, they took care of her. What did you guys talk about when you saw them again? On our, you know, on our life during the war. Because I came with my uh, cousin, she wanted to know all sorts of stuff. Did Marta remind you of any things that happened? She didn't have to remind me, I remember very well. <laughs> but she's, they're just amazing people, I mean. Yeah. She's just an amazing woman. 
I don't know people like that ever in any place in the world. These people are amazing. He took care of me, this young man, which is a grandson. When we went to the Air Force plane, and it was cold, it was horrible, it was <laughs> disgusting. This was here, just in October? When we went from October to Poland. And then I stayed at their home, and we had a wonderful time, but, you know. Do they feel like family to you? Oh, yeah, definitely. This is my family. I don't have any other family. Besides my children, grandchildren, this is my family. There's some others, my husband's over there, it's nothing to do with them. These people are amazing. You do not find them, they do not exist in any place in the world. For me, they are just people that do everything for nothing. They don't, they don't ask for any return for what they do. It is, you don't find that many people like that. Mm -hmm. Not even in your own family. I'm very, very fortunate. I really am. I could have been dead 300 times, if not them. They were actually, there's stuff that you don't have here, but there's some other things. And... Like some other things? Well, you didn't talk about my, my being after I got out of Warsaw Ghetto. You didn't ask me questions about that. When you went to the Young Schlagplatz, or...? No, no, after Warsaw Ghetto. Okay. When yeah, I went to the Polish side. Right. Well, you don't have anything about that. No, I just, I asked you about being in hiding. But can you tell me what life was like for you at, once you were living on the Polish side? Well, basically, I tried... My nanny was one of the most amazing people, so in 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 the respect of not making tragedy of anything, just taking life as it goes and being and address the, the danger as it comes. And because I don't have a Semitic look, so I could be outside, you know. I, so we played the game that I'm her daughter, even though I don't look like her, and she, does, she looks Jewish and I look Polish. This is the irony of everything. Uh, so, you know, I was with her, but a lot of things happened while I was on the other side. Can you tell me something? Yeah, that's actually important. Um, on the, uh, when I was on the other side, it was a place called Vishnyova Gura. It's like a very beautiful place outside Warsaw. People go there on vacations and stuff. Somebody killed a German gendarme. One of the Polish people killed them, Polish underground. They took that guy and they buried them under, in a hole, and they camouflaged it with a pine tree, a little small pine tree. Well, the dog found him in one day. They uncovered it, and that was a law that for every German killed, they're going to kill 2,000 Poles. So then what happened? Okay, so when we were sleeping at one place and the, the German started gathering, there was nothing to do with the Jews. The German were gathering Polish people and getting them out of the house and separating men and women. And the idea was they're going to kill the women and the kids and the men are going to go to labor camp. So they came to us when I was in that place, whatever. It was a beautiful Polish villa, gorgeous to this day. It's absolutely fantastic place, very rich people, very big intellectuals. And my nanny, you know, pretended she did some work there, pretended she's a maid, that she cleans the house. We were sleeping in the kitchen when the German came in. And they collected everybody and then they came to us. And they asked, who are you? She said, well, it's me, I'm a maid here cleaning and this is my daughter. And I don't look like her at all. I'm blonde and blue eyes, she's dark if you look at the picture. Well, they said, no, 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 no. 
you must be Jewish to her. And you took this little girl, poor Polish child, to camouflage me. But she was a very, very brave woman. She stood up and they say, do you have a birth certificate? And we did, false. Some, you know, uh, priest, some, you know, fabricated. So he shows her the birth certificate. So, she, so it's written on the birth certificate that she's my mother, but the father is unknown. So they asked, <laughs> she didn't know German, really. <laughs> but there was somebody translating. So she asked, he asked her, where is the father? Where is the girl? She's your daughter, right? Yeah. It doesn't look like you at all. Uh, so where is the father? Stand up. So she stood up and she, <laughs> she was pretty, so she said that in a vulgar language, she excused me, F me, and he, he left. That German started laughing hysterical and left us. Saved, she saved us at that moment because he would shoot us. But he, she was so brave, this woman. But then she left and then he collect, they collected all of us and they separated women and men, men and put on one mountain and the women on the other one. We had to cross a river which was totally frozen. But they chased us on the on this, the, the ice of the river to that little mountain. It wasn't mountains; a small kind of a how do you call it? It's not a mountain. It's like a hill. little mountain. How do you call it? A hill. Hill, right? And the hill was here, and then they dig out a big hole, which feel they're going to shoot us. They're going to put us into this hole. So, <laughs> my nanny, God bless her. <laughs> She was holding my hand, and they, they separated women and they separated men. And we were standing, it was freezing. You don't know Polish winter. We're talking freezing, very cold. And I was frozen to death. And I, she held my hand and I said, where are they going to kill us? I can't stand like that anymore. She said, don't worry, very soon. She was very composed. She did not make any fuss. She said, very soon we're going to go to, to heaven. You're, not, you're going to be warm. But lucky enough, I didn't really care. I didn't care that they're going to kill us because it was that cold that she just couldn't bear it. <laughs> so she started telling the story. She just said, I don't believe that myself. But anyway, uh, they already dig out a hole which will shoot us there, all of that. But somebody must have given somebody's order not to do it because they were afraid that the Polish are going to, they're going to fight or something. Let us go. They were standing five hours and they told us to go. They took the men to labor camp and the women and children they released. So this is after the ghetto, after Umschlagplatz. And this is the woman that you see here in that picture. So even after escaping the ghetto, you were still oh, yeah. at risk? That was, that was actually one of the very hard ones. To stand right in front of a pit and be, you know, to be, be shot. You, you, at one point, you completely froze. You don't have any emotions. Zero. That was, a, a, there was a few times that you really faced death. That was probably the, the one, the most... I was standing in front of a hole. I, was, I knew they were going to shoot us there, and I wanted that. I wanted to die. I couldn't stand anymore the cold weather. How do you think that's affected you to this day, coming so close to death so many times? Well, um, it was very good for me that I went to the army. That kind of saved my grace. They gave me a, a gun. Uh, which I cherish and, and, and baby and cleaning and it was my gun was the cleanest one in the whole the whole division. Um, I felt that that I can protect myself. At that point, I started going back. Normal. I never went back to normal. Not even when I'm talking to you right now. 
uh, but it can be normal after quite something. Uh, besides other things I went through in my life, but uh, you know, trying to be as normal as possible. How do you think being a Holocaust survivor has affected? First of all, I don't like what they call me a Holocaust survivor. What do you? So scratch that out. Okay. Okay. Uh, what What would you like me to say? Um. Uh, let me Let me rephrase it. How do you think your experiences have affected you you as a mother and a wife? Very protective over my children. Some of the confidence I miss, definitely. If, if, if I feel that there is a danger situation, things come back. But relatively to other people, I think I did very well because I do a lot of things. I don't sit at home and dwell on, on the Holocaust. Actually, years and years, I didn't allow to even speak about that near me, to get rid of that. Do you experience nightmares? I'm sorry? Do you have nightmares? I did. Right now, nightmares are about other things, but I did, yes, of course. Listen, I, at one point, I decided to convert myself into be Christian. Really? Mm-hmm. Why was that? Um, because I saw the... In Poland, do you have a lot of you know, crosses on the ro roads, and you see Jesus on the cross. And I was asking, what is this? I said, well, it's Jesus. I said, who is Jesus? This is our God. Why is he on the cross? because he devoted his life and he died for his people. I said, that makes sense. Why our God let us die? This guy died for us. I decided to be a Christian and converted myself in my mind to be a Christian and follow all the rituals, went to church, all of that. It's a whole big story. Was this during your time in Poland? Not only in Poland, when I back to Israel. It took a long time for me to become Jew again. What made you come back to being Jewish? Well, I was in a Jewish atmosphere, I went to school. Um, I'm not exactly Jew to this day. I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about the other things. So what is your relationship to Judaism? I do have a relationship with Jesus, our history, and in that respect, uh, my father was very devoted to Israel. My mother, no, but he did, okay? Uh, and I believe that we need to have a country, so this thing will never happen again. And I became a proud woman because I was a soldier for this country, and both, he participated in few wars. So for me, Israel is very important. I don't like what's happening in Israel altogether right now. I think uh, we're never going to live like that. We have to do something different. Do you identify as a Zionist? It's more than a Zionist. Zion is over. We, we have Israel now. We don't have to look at Zion necessarily. Uh, you know, we have a very strong, beautiful country. So I was a soldier there. I worked in a very prestigious institution there. And I was an Israeli. My children born in Israel speak Hebrew. Did you ever hear that story? <laughs> I can't even. It's the amount of times that you almost died. It's incredible. Yeah. And, like, to be so small. What's really incredible that I'm still alive and have normal. I'm not saying I'm full normal. But half I'm, I'm, I managed to be half normal. Why? Because I have a very loving family. I greet my children, I love my grandchildren, I love the friends, Paul and those people are amazing, really amazing people, one of a kind. Uh, so there is hope, you know, there is definitely, there's a lot of disappointment in the human race, what's happening in the universe right now, but there is also hope, so you cannot really lose your, your marbles from all of those things. And I happen to be a speaker for Jewish Museum of the Heritage, so I'm trying to educate people and 
tell her what to do, not to become like a sheep and go to be killed without resistance. Do you think you inherited your resilience from your father? But in the genes, probably, but mostly from my nanny. She was a, a rock of Gibraltar. Nothing moved her. That's how we survived, because we were in such tremendously dangerous situation so many times. I didn't mention everything um, that I learned. Let me give you for an instance. When the war started and my father brought me to this, when we were, we were gathering there, and they made some kind of a synagogue there, I got very sick. I got very, very high fever. But the Jews, the people that were there, they decided to pray to God, maybe something's going to happen and the war is not going to happen. So they went out from the, it was on, on the ground floor, so they went out to the fresh air, because Jews are, like to pray outside. They go to God. In the meantime, I had 40, 40 Celsius fever lying there dying. But my nanny was near me. They forgot about me. My, even my parents. But she stayed. My mother I wasn't even there. My mother was not one of the praying people. But they all went to pray to ask God to help them to blah, blah, blah. And just my nanny saw that I'm dying. Because I was probably 40 fever Celsius. She went. There was no aspirin there. We were talking war. So she went to the kitchen. And she pulled out potatoes. And she sliced the potatoes and put them on my head. And by osmosis, the potatoes suck up the heat from my head and I survive. There you go. She saved your life in many times. Many times. And now these Polish people saved my life again. Right? Yeah. So we're going to write a book about it. Are you going to write a book? Yeah. There are some amazing people in this world. Yeah. I want to teach people to be better than they are now. First of all, not, not talking better, not be stupid. People are stupid, you know that? They follow like sheep, everybody, the moron that comes and talks to them. That's what Hitler did. That's how they all followed him. And they, yeah. that's, that's the lesson, actually, that I learned from this whole Holocaust. Not to follow everybody, blindly. Um, not to follow leaders blindly? I'm not sorry? Not to follow leaders blindly? or Anybody. And my children, I don't allow them to follow blindly. If I tell them something to do, they have to know why. And they've grown up very well. And that's what I teach as an educator. It's most, the most important thing, by the way. More, than any, more important than anything else making sure that people know how to think by themselves and they don't follow blind people. Okay. I think... You um, done? Yeah. Is that all right? Yeah. With you? Yeah. You can edit, right? So move things around or no? No, they don't do any editing. Okay. All right. You okay. had a long work, right? What? It was a long time. Is there anything else you'd Let's, like to say? No, um, yeah, is there anything else you'd like to say? I don't know. The, as I say, the most important thing that I'm telling you right now is that I hope that my story will teach Titu how not to blindly follow other leaders. That's all, that's all I want from them, nothing more. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to pause the camera. Um. Before we paused, we were talking about uh, your nanny and how she helped you, but she also helped your father, is that right? Right. She wanted to save my father. So she arranged the place that we were with kind of a countryside, so it was a little barn there. So she decided that we can go and collect some wood, you know, branches, and build like a tent in the barn. 
and then bring my because he was working for the German cleaning the evidence, and bring my father and stick him out there under these branches. So that was the plan. And actually, these other people, the cousin of the, uh, this Marta, who was a policeman, a Polish policeman. So we, there was a chance that maybe she can dig them out. So, so she prepared everything, and she was. We were going to collect the branches for this. And I was asking for why the branches, and she said, "This is going to be for to to save your father." So and we built this whole thing in the in the barn, prepared for him. And now she got probably some kind of a. This wasn't a phone call, but somehow she knew that she has to go to bring my father. She didn't tell me that she's going to bring my father, but. She said that she has to leave me in that country and she's going to go for some hours to do something. I didn't question. I knew we're not questioning this thing. But, but there was a lot of hours, so she was afraid to what I'm going to do. I was a little girl, six years old. So she said to me the following. She brought beans and she said, listen, we don't have food right now. We need to grow these beans so we're going to have food. When I'm gone, you take every bean, make a little lines, take every bean and put them in the distance, measure it, and make sure they have a distance from one to another, and put the beans until I come back, and then they will grow, and when I bring you father, we're going to have something to eat. She knew that put all the beans will take me three, four hours, and she knew that this will keep me busy. And that's what she did. I was sitting there and putting the beans because I knew that I need to save my father, right? She unfortunately came without my father. So we didn't discuss anything anymore. But the beans grew. The beans germinated before we left this place. They did. Where was this? It was in the country town where I was hiding with her. I think it was brilliant. She's she was a smart woman. She, she knew how to survive. And she knew you cannot leave a little girl do nothing. Okay? So she gave me something important to do. I never forget that. I think it's one of the most important things. She gave me the beans to put them in. She's very amazing. Amazing people. That's all I can say. That's why I don't despair about the world, because there are some good people there. Yeah. Some terrible, but there's some very good ones. Maybe the good will prevail. I don't know. I'm trying to do my best. Thank you. I think it was important. No, really, yeah. She understood children. No, she was she had the she had the instinct for life, the right instincts for life, surviving. Mm -hmm. She had no fear. And if you are slave to fear, you're dead. If you can get rid of fear, you're going to be okay. That's what I'm working on. I'm not there. I'm not like her. I'm Jewish, unfortunately. <laughs> but, but the woman had... We were, when we were in Poland, now we were talking about this whole thing. I mean, she had... She put potatoes on my... I mean... Those things, nobody write in books, nobody give a recipe, nobody go to psychiatrists to tell them that you have potatoes on somebody's head, or put beans. Go to psychiatrists that he will invent to have to put beans in the ground. Nobody's going to tell you that. That's so what I'm not going to a psychiatrist, never. <laughs> no, she was, I mean, I am still under the spell of these people because I just came back from Israel. We, we went to another tragedy. They asked me, <laughs> This the funny thing, well, we come to Israel and it's the holiday of Sukkot, right? And they see all of a sudden the Polish people. They see these people building, we're talking Jerusalem, there's plenty of the Sukkot, it's all over the place. So they're asking me, was it night before they started bombing at Jerusalem? And they asking me, what is this? Why are people living here? So I explained to them, I'm a teacher. So I told them, Sukkot is a holiday that that symbolize fragility. It means life is not, life is fragile. You never know what's going to happen tomorrow. So you build a temporary home. Life is temporary. 
So they were very, very impressed. And at night we have we have <laughs> stuff bombarding Jerusalem. <laughs> he said, "What the hell did you tell us, Amarty? I told you the truth. That's the holiday of Sukkot." <laughs> This is absolutely hilarious. I mean, as you say, you couldn't write it. Well, you probably have one of the nicest interviews, right? Tell me the truth. Yeah, no, very. It's great, really great. Thank Listen, you. I, I, I'm a public speaker, so I know how to talk. Yeah, I'm glad. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so this book that you see here is written by my uncle, which was my mom's br brother. He was a historian, and he wrote a book about the Jewish cemetery. His name was Henrik Zimmler. He lived in Poland. He survived the war in Russia, and then he lived in, was a professor in Polish University after the war. That's one of these books that I have that he wrote. It's history of all the Jewish cemetery in Warsaw. Thank you. Um? This this uh, artifacts was pro uh, produced or created by my father Eliau for uh, Jewish holidays for the wine and gave as a present to his brother in France, Eli Buchwald. Um, what does what is the, the mon monogram of whoever he gave this present to? I don't know. Thank you. This is a little honey vessel that you give a child when he was born. So he created it for his brother's son. Thank you. That you may was able to get it. The brush that my father created for my nanny for Christmas. They gave it to her. So she he created that. Do you know what it's made of? I don't, I think it was gold or something like that, but we had to fix it because it was, you know, it was very worn out. For many years, talking, millions of years. Thank you. Okay. Amazing women. Can you tell us who's in the photos? Okay. So what do you want me to say? Just who they are. The names? Yeah. Maria Popinska on the right, on my right, and Marta Bohenska. These are two women that saved my life. And they were awarded the Righteous Among Nations by Yad Vashem. Thank you. Can you tell us about these documents? Yeah, this document is my testimony in a trial of Shepsul Rotholz for collaborating with the Nazis during the Holocaust. And I was saved by this, he was a Jewish policeman, he saved my life, and after the war, which is another story, and after the war, he actually gave my name to the, to the courts to be a witness, and I was, uh, here I am, in his defense. And what was the outcome of the trial? He was convicted. Um, they took away from all sorts of rights. And then he went to the Polish trial and they completely con uh, took away everything because he was such a famous boxer. And then they explained, these people did something during the Holocaust. It's very hard to judge people in those circumstances. Did you see him in the courtroom? Of course. There's a picture. You can find it in the in the archives. I not only see him in the courtroom, how do you think he got my name? How did he get your name? Oh, it's another story. You want another story? I mean, yeah, we should really say. Yeah, we should. <laughs> this is a whole other story. Uh, can we tell it, John? Sure. Right. Oh, shit. Um, how does it? After the Holocaust, you know, people were looking, not after the Holocaust, after the World War II, people were looking for, listen, I'm telling you this story doesn't go anywhere because I don't want people starting writing books about it. Oh, well, this is just, I mean, we shouldn't tape it then, right? It's off the record. You want me to stop taping? Yeah, should we not tape this? It's important. It would be just for the Shoah Foundation. 
Um, but then again, that stuff does. It's up to you. Yeah. I'm gonna pause. I think this is a birth certificate which is false, which was created by a priest, I suppose, that I am a daughter of my nanny, Marisha Popinska, and my name is now Halina. What are we, Halina? Yeah. Halina Popinska, and that was the document I was presenting to the German when he came to kill us. Thank you. Wow. Can you tell us about this picture? Yeah, this is a picture, very important, because this is my beloved doll, which I survived with her in the call box. Thank you. Yeah, this is a Saski Ogrut, Saski Garden in Warsaw. And I used to go there with my nanny to play games and to build little cakes from sand. And I look like Shirley Temple because that was in vogue. So they took my hair, which was straight, and they made them curls. How did they make the curls? They took uh, iron, you know. The... Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this, which picture? This one is my nanny and myself at uh, Muranowska Street going for, you know, for a walk. It's across the street from Umschlagplatz. And when was this? Oh my God, it's right before the war, I think. It was very tiny then. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's, it's a picture for school just after the war. So how old were you here, maybe? Ten. Okay. It's my mother in high school. I wonder what year around was that? What? What year do we think that might have been? I don't know. I really don't know. It must have been beginning of 19th century. Yeah. She would be 100 years old right now, I don't know how much. Probably. Okay. Yes, that's Stefa, and she was murdered by the Ukraine soldiers, or Ukraine, whatever. They cut her in pieces, and she was pregnant. And she, which one is she? And, and not, not this one. This. Well, well. And who else is in the photo? What? Who else is in the photo? They all are here. No, my mom is in the middle. Chama, you see that, right? Mm -hmm. With the sticks. Yeah. On the right hand side, the little one, this one that lived in Paris, the one with long hair is the one that kept me going. And the one that's standing is the guy that wrote the book. Henrik. On the left side. Henry. Okay. There they are. Thank you. This is uh, Ilana and Kibbutz. Finally, I made sure and collected a few pennies and bought myself this beautiful shirt, which I was very proud of. Thank you. This is Be'er Ora in Israel. I'm in the Gadna. I'm sorry, it's not there. Gadna. And this is when? I was 17, 16 years old. Thank you. This is Ilana Yari in her prime, and she's on her men hunting in Natania. In Believe me, I had them a lot. How old were you here? Um, 22. I wasn't even, yeah, 21, 22. Beautiful. This is my aunt, Hanka. She was my mother's sister. And she raised me after the war until I went to kibbutz and the army. Thank you. Which one? This one? Yeah. This is my beloved, beloved, beloved father when he was young. And when where was it? Where amazing we? people. Where was this picture taken? In Paris, I think. Because he, somebody took it. His brother took it. Probably. It's an amazing human being. Thank you.